1986. He was recognized in 2001 by Golf Week magazine as one of the 40 most influential people in the game of golf under the age of 40. He's not, he's not under 40. <laughs> An honor he shared with Tiger Woods and Jack Nicklaus. He's an international expert in golf and sports turf management, published hundreds of articles, he's traveled around the world lecturing on environmentally responsible and sustainable turf grass management, uh, less reliance on fertilizer and pesticide. He's appeared on CNN, ESPN, PBS, The Golf Channel, and just in numerous magazines, USA Weekend, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. Um, he's been a visiting professor at the Swedish Agricultural University, and um, he served as lead turf consultant for New York Yankees, Green Bay Packers, the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts, and so on. He's got a long list here. In addition to his career in turf, Frank is married and the father of three children, a triathlete, a member of his local school board, hospice volunteer, little league coach, and alpaca farmer. And overachiever. <laughs>
have done some really cool things. And of course, we can be fairly whimsical. Uh, this is an artist down in Texas who uh, her lawn was dormant, uh, Bermuda grass or dormant St. Augustine grass, whatever the heck that crabgrass is you're growing down there, Felder. Um, it looks much better with polka dots sprayed on it. And then, of course, there's the functional aspect, and that's where I want to start. This is what's been the most comfortable for me. Um, grass is function. This is uh, in between the strips on this tram, uh, where obviously there's pavement. They've grasped it. And we've been doing a lot of work with Nina Basic, uh, looking at um, uh, the, stru the structural soil she developed that they can grow street trees on. We're now using it to grow grass on and thinking about starting to replace these four acre Walmart Mart parking lots with grass parking lots that can then filter a lot of the pollutants that would come off the vehicles in the parking lot. We're nuts about grass in this country, and I'm sure you know that. Uh, just in New York State alone, we have about three and a half million acres of turf that we would call turf, managed grass. And we spend about $5 billion a year in New York State. About 75 to 80 billion nationally is spent managing grass. So we're absolutely nutty about grass. And, you know, I, I think I spend most of my career trying to figure out how to help us not be so nutty. But the fact is, most of that money is spent by homeowners in and around their lawns. So, some people go to extremes, take the lawn out, pile up some gravel, and of course then, you know, on a hot summer day, you're going to feel fairly warm. Matter of fact, you may see one of the more ridiculous things in your life. Walking outside today, if you venture out at all, uh, if, on this side of campus where we have some of our sports fields, there's a synthetic turf field hockey field, plastic grass, that we water four times a day with what can only be described as a fire hose sprinkler to cool it off because it's so warm to play on that the athletes can't stay on it very long unless it's, unless it's cooled off. Now, functionally, obviously, this is a moss mat to come out of the shower and step on that, that's actually not such a bad deal. Uh, and of course, a lot of these things you can uh, buy or do yourself. Now, back to the functional part. I spend a lot of my time working at a fairly, uh, you know, with school districts, uh, regular folk trying to have decent grass for the safety of their athletes. And then we get to talk about how even at the professional level, uh, managing turf for these athletes to ensure their safety, maximize their performance and ensure their safety is really critical. This was, of course, a game that the Pittsburgh Steelers played a number of years ago where they brought in grass and sod it over an existing field, three inches of rainfall, and it turned into a muddy mess where the athletes weren't safe at all. So we spent a lot of time trying to help uh, clubs and athletes uh, have a safe surface to play on. Now, there is an aesthetic part to what we do. It looks, you know, what you do for looks. And this is actually one of our research experiments where we're looking at different forms of iron. Iron is one of the really critical nutrients for color in a, in a green plant because it's involved in the chlorophyll molecule. So if you really want to do something crazy on your lawn and don't want to fertilize it, and we've done some work looking at using iron as opposed to um, fertilizers that might contaminate water quality, um, we found that iron is a really easy way to get green grass without having to get it to grow so much. This is something we were experimenting with. Now, of course, golf courses, we, one could find some art in this little practice facility that was built, and you start to see some of the striping effects, and the interaction with the bunkers at different heights of cut. You've got a, green, a putting surface cut at about a tenth of an inch, a fairway cut at about a third of an inch, and then you've got grass around the bunkers that are probably cut at about two or three inches. So sometimes just the different heights can give you a very different look. This is the flower hole at the Stevens Point Country Club in central Wisconsin, where I used to work before I came back to Cornell. They changed this floral display three times a year. And of course, I'm sure all of you are looking at the flowers. I'm always, of course, looking at the grass. Uh, but the contrast here between the colors in the, you know, the deep green of the grass and the uh, 
various colors of the flowers. They change this display three times a year. It takes about 14 employees, the better part of 40 hours, to change the floral displays. Here's one of my favorite pictures. This is Bandon Dunes, or Pacific Dunes Golf Course, right along the southwestern Oregon coast. It's a fairly new golf course. And what I love is how grass kind of brings out the subtle wrinkles in the earth here. There was very little done when this golf course was built and designed by Cornell alum Tom Doak. This is a very minimalist golf course. Um, very little was done here. You can see they just kind of threw some sand in places. This is just a beautiful piece of land that uh, they planted some grass over the top and there's very little management done out there uh, to keep this a playable surface. Of course, you can get ridiculous with this, and some people like golf so much they do it in their office. Nothing living there. And then there's, of course, the occasional fool who decides to grass his entire inside of the house and, of course, sucking the fumes. You can imagine why he's so happy. <laughs> and then there's a functional aspect of room. So we have a room inside, and here is a room at the State Fair. The New York State Fair last year. Um, there was a living sculpture demonstration done there where they built a couple of uh, sitting chairs, a little love seat, a couch, which you will uh, be involved in working on today. And one of the things that we're, you know, constantly, you know, obviously it looks good right now. You're going to get to do something today that might help it sustain itself. Sometimes getting these things watered and keeping them healthy um, is a little tricky. So we've been figuring out ways of doing that in a sustainable fashion. Um, I get to work in some fairly ridiculous environments. Um, this is a project I've been working on for the last five years associated with the 65th Street uh, renovation for Lincoln Center, uh, the Lincoln Center Development Project. This is the conceptual drawing that they started with about five years ago, and this is what it looked like last week. <laughs> this is the Juilliard School right here. This is the new addition to the Juilliard School. This is Alice Tully Hall, and this is a $25 million lawn roof, which is going to be a park on top of a restaurant on 65th Street. So pretty soon you'll get to see this uh, in living color if you live down in Manhattan or wander down that way. This is at Kew Gardens. Again, functionally, grass can be a great thing for bleachers, maybe for stepping stones, maybe for just functionally having it in your backyard for stairs up and down or just giving you that cascading effect. And make transition to using grass for forms. This is at Dartmouth College at, uh, at yeah, Dartmouth in, in, in New Hampshire. I can tell you that one of the things that guys like me struggle with is architects who sit there, draw it on a piece of paper and say, oh, isn't that look really cool? And then somebody's got to take care of it. The poor guy's got to, you know, have a sprinkler that he has here to, you know, everybody wants it green, and he's got to climb up here to trim this tip by hand because you can't really get up there with anything. So uh, these do create unique problems. Uh, the students love them, but they are a unique uh, uh, maintenance situation. Now, from a form perspective, it can be fairly simple. These are little indoor grass planters that you can get on the web just to have out in your in your house. The Chia Professor, maybe this is where your kids will start. Uh, you can use the uh, little plant seeds that they send you, or you can use grass seed just as well. And here's the swimmer again. Just, you know, a matter of mounding up some grass and making it look like the uh, swimmer is making his way through. And you can see how intricate this is. This, obviously, the structure is the, one of the highlights here. But you can see the interaction with his face and the grass there, and the mounds looking where his hands are going in. Um, I mean, it's just really a fascinating display. And again, one of the things about some of this artwork is it doesn't stay around long. You do it, it looks really cool, and then they take it away. And all that lives are the pictures. And here's my own project. This is the uh, moss snake. This is from that TurfWorks book by. Paul Cooper, who he was here a number of years ago, it was very pleasant meeting him, and he we took some of these scans right out of his book. Again, nothing more than some stone and 
One of the tricks we use for moss is mixing it with, in a blender with buttermilk. Take moss, put it in a blender, mix it up with buttermilk, and just smear it on there. And, you know, it grows on rocks. As long as it gets a little bit of moisture, it usually will grow fairly well. Some really interesting uh, structures that you can do with longer grass, uh, as well as planting grass over a, uh, almost like a topiary. Now, one of the things that I've liked about this is, you know, when you go start looking around for these things, you see how people use grass, you know, to make a stake. And this is at the University of Illinois. Um, they planted these boxes to represent the age child fatality statistics. There's 3,000 blades of grass in a square foot. And, and to, to uh, recognize the 60,000 uh, people per year under the age of 12 who die of AIDS. And so they used just having the grass out there as a way of honoring that, uh, those people. And then just odd forms of artwork inside. Uh, a structure that is basically <coughs> suspended from a ceiling with grow lights and sod laid over the top of it. Of course, uh, again, you can use plastic grass, and this is an example of that where they use some living plant material for the bucket, but the uh, carpet itself here is synthetic turf. This is the London Museum of Art, um, and you can see the guy watering it. <laughs> uh, it's basically just a big pile of grass, and um, it really fascinating at night when I was there. It was really, really amazing. This is a chapel in Czechoslovakia. In, I'm not Czechoslovakia, in the Czech Republic. Someone sent me this one. Craig sends me a lot of these. But you can see they put grass on the outside as well as on the inside. And you can see it growing here. And, and basically, it's the kind of thing that they do and then strip off, and every year we'll redo it and, of course, completely recycle all the things that are used to do it. But the structure itself is cement. And, of course, here's a little topiary thing with some grass on it. And, of course, now you can start, again, in getting into the whimsical a little bit. Um, the giraffe uh, on the lawn, people like putting things on their lawns. And then we get into the whole animal range, and you'll meet one of our favorite animal construction people, Danielle, today. Uh, this is, again, out of uh, that Turf Works book. Again, uh, if you can't have grass alive, here's a synthetic version of the bull. And here she is. Um, one, I think, really one of our stars. Um, I remember when she was taking Marsha's class. She showed up, and this was part of one of her art of horticulture projects. She shows up in my office and, um, you know, talk about doing this. And she has this tray with her. And on the tray are about seven different farm animals. And she's got a cow, a horse, a chicken, a goat, a pig, a sheep. And she's like, this is what I want to do. I'm like, okay, I, don't, I think we got to do one. <laughs> Let's try to do one. And I think uh, it was really, uh, really epitomized kind of the energy that she's brought to doing this. And um, so this is, again, a shaped pile of soil. And she built this head with chicken wire and stuffed it with hay. And there's these two by fours that are attaching it into the soil pile. And I can tell you, of all the graduations, of the 15 or 16 graduation weekends I've been a part of, I've never seen so many people gathered around a single thing uh, in my entire career here. Everybody wanted their picture taken on graduation weekend in front of Morrison Hall. And Cow. Does it have a name? Is it Daisy? Missy. Missy Sue. <laughs> and there's some more, more of uh, Danielle's work. Now, what, what was fascinating about this piece of project is, is it evolved. It started out as green grass shaped letters for the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences, right? Cows, right out on the quad. But then as it started to die and go dormant, she spray painted it black. So it had a whole other um, life after it was still living. Now, here's, this is how simple this is. This was uh, Marsha's, uh, from a few years ago, one of her art of horticulture projects with a bunch
bunch of students and we had a couple of hours to do it. And I, my staff um, made, gave us a pile of dirt and that's what you'll start out with today if you're doing this particular project. And then we get out there and we get all kinds of people running side cutters. Or I am supervising. <laughs> and the idea was to create this walk path um, around this mound and that's what it looked like when we were done. We cut the sod from an adjacent area. We used water to kind of tamp down the path area and then laid some sod over the top and there's the class at the very end. This is the year, the, the following year, the class uh, wanted to try something different. So again, we started with a mound of dirt. We made stairs um, and at the top they planted a door, which I have to tell you that the Cornell golf course is right over here, the eighth hole, and there was an enormous amount of interest. Matter of fact, when you come over the hill on the eighth hole and you see this, all you can actually see is the door, and you're like, what the hell is the door doing out there? And so uh, this was really quite a thing until a 50 mile an hour wind came and took the door away. So it uh, has not, the door is no longer there, but the mound is still there. Now this is Marsh's project at Longwood Gardens that uh, Basically, uh, again, just another form of soil and grass. There was a, a mold made to shape the uh, pattern. Um, yeah. And I just want to, Alex Lavallo, who um, there he is. really, he had done the design for this and worked on the project with me, is also one of the workshop presenters. Yeah, and you'll see Alex again in another picture here. How long did this live? That lived a week. A week. But it's all reusable. Okay, now how about furniture? This is some of what you're going to do. Nice little bed here and a chair. In the middle of Paris, a little, little lawn chair sitting there. And you can see the size of it relative to things around. It's a fairly large chair. And you can do this in your yard. All kinds of lawn furniture. You can actually be fairly sophisticated about it. Or you can just take a chaise lounge and lay some... Lay some grass over the top of it, nice and easy. Some variations of sod sofas. Here's a nice one integrated into a garden. You can buy a cardboard structure, fill it up with soil, and plant some grass over the top, and that's available at inhabit.com. Fairly easy to do, um, something that you can do in your own backyard. Some whimsical things, these foam grass blades that we found, little sod end table here. Another bed, maybe with some sheets installed. Really fairly inviting, I think. And then, or something simple. This was one of our very first efforts that Alex built. Uh, this is one of the Art of Horticulture students. Fairly simple. Here's how it started out with a bare area. A pile of compost that the Cornell grounds people brought over. Alex started to shape it. And then you've got a sod couch. So fairly easy to do. You can. Um, one of the things that we've seen useful is maybe just a hand trim where you sit. But you don't have to mow it. You can mow it. Uh, mowing encourages it to spread and get thicker. Okay. But this one's so small it could be done by hand fairly easily. Just shears. Yeah, I would recommend that. Mm -hmm. Or uh, we have some battery operated shears that right. we use too. I, I don't like the idea of a string trimmer because they're very difficult to keep level. And what happens if you've ever worked one, it really pulls it into the ground. And then you've got these brown half moons all over the structure. Now, this is a project that Marsha's husband uh, did at one of his old camps. And here's Alex, who you'll see today. Um, again, you know, like Tom Watson said over the weekend, a bunch of old fogies, right? Getting around, piling up some dirt, shaping it with a little bit of moisture laying some grass over the top, and lo and behold, you've got a couch to sit on. How long did that take? It took about three, four hours. There you go. Uh, can you use grass seed, or does it have to be all rolled out? Perfectly? Yeah, very good question. Um, you can use grass seed, but then, of course, you're waiting. But I would recommend on some of these slopes that if you did that, that you use some kind of erosion mat because of the steepness of the slope, even gently watering it. Um, is going to cause some erosion. But you can, there's lots of erosion type mats you can use. Or, you know, even at the garden center, they sell the, that 
seed mulch stuff, mm. you can just pack that on like a mud pack if you don't want to use uh, a sod. Now, you can cut sod from one part in your yard, and that's what we did out at, the, out at our research center where we, we did it with the students. We just cut it from one place and put it in another place. Another question? Sorry. So, yeah. like the more complicated couches, are, is there armature inside? Um, some of them, like the, there was one where there are some, you know, little pieces of wood or metal just to kind of hold things together. But generally, it's just piles of soil. And once the grass gets stabilized, it really holds it together fairly well. This is a project that Alex did down at the Ithaca Youth Bureau in honor of Marcia and her husband Scott. And again, this is the nice integration of stonework with a little bit of a couch here. This is right in our little downtown Teaburg. Our little, uh, this is our little village where we live in tr up, just up the lake a little bit. And again, just a pile of soil, a couple of rocks at the end. I think you tried time up here, didn't you? How'd that work? It didn't work. It didn't work, okay. It gets too much love, this couch, we think. <laughs> the kids love this little bit. And then some of Marsha's students have done some lawn furniture. This is nothing more than a flat of grow mix put in a greenhouse with tons of ryegrass seed. And you make a little cushion, and you pull it out of the flat, and put it on top of the chair, and you've got a lawn chair. How about an entire bar? <laughs> Not a bad deal. This is one of Marsha's students. What was his name? Zach. Zach, yeah. He was a maniac, this kid. This is just a bunch of grass grown on burlap that we slapped on top of a, uh, um, a structure he made on wheels. And there's his little uh, tiki bar. <laughs> OK, so what about mowing patterns? And you're going to see, you're going to have a little workshop about this. This is probably the easiest of all things to do because it's simply a matter of mowing the grass in different or rolling the grass, or in some cases, spritzing it with a little water. There was a, uh, I, I actually didn't incorporate the picture, um, but if you watch the Major League Baseball All-Star Game, which it doesn't look like many of you would actually turn the Major League Baseball All-Star Game on, but if you did, you would have seen the St. Louis, they played it in St. Louis, and in the outfield they had an, uh, in the grass an image of the Gateway Arch, and underneath it an image burned into the grass, uh, of the state of the, the state capital of Missouri. And they had these little windows in there. And I was talking to the groundskeeper maybe a month or so ago, and he just gets a little water spritzer and spritz the water into these squares, mats the grass down, so it's folded in one direction, different from the way the grass is mowed. And you get patterns. Nice and simple at Yankee Stadium. That's the way we like it there. Much more interested in winning baseball games and having fancy patterns on the grass. But Dave Meller wrote a wonderful book called Picture Perfect. If you're interested in this, it's really an interesting little read, very simple, how to take care of grass very simply. I knew Dave when he was the groundskeeper at Milwaukee County Stadium, where the Brewers used to play. And he was the one that originally started a lot of this craze that's going on in the um, turf industry with regard to mowing patterns. Dave is now the groundskeeper for the Boston Red Sox at Fenwick Park. So we have, we have uh, sometimes grounds managers who maybe have an acid flashback or something. <laughs> and you can imagine what the athletes, and of course, if you're sitting on the other side of the field, it looks completely different. Here's the Starburst, uh, again at County Stadium. This was popular there at uh, Shea Stadium for a while before they closed up. This is Frontier Field in Rochester in preparation for the AAA All-Star Game a few years ago again. Nothing more than just mowing the patterns in different directions. This is Rosenblatt Stadium, home of the College World Series with some baseballs on it. And it gets fairly sophisticated. Um, you can get fairly sophisticated or fairly simple. This is um, uh, Corey Mellor's uh, drawing for her dad. Dad, can you do this? And he went out to County Stadium and did. Now, sometimes people do some really goofy things by accident. This was a person in central Wisconsin who was very worried about fertilizer running off their lawn. So her idea was put the fertilizer in a drop spreader, 
open it all the way up, run around the lawn, and put the water on really quick, because then it'll all get even. Right? If you just put it down there and water it, it runs off so much that it'll all get even. We got a call from this person who thought this was a mole <laughs> running around the yard. So you can do these kinds of things just with a little bit of fertilizer. Because you can see, the fertilizer doesn't move very far from where you put it down. But again, it doesn't have to be very complicated. Here's a very simple pattern, just mowing in crop circles, if you've ever read Michael Pollan's work, particularly in Second Nature, where he has this chapter called Why Mow. Um, he talks about mowing crop circles in his lawn, and most people can do this fairly easily. Really, the only requirement is, is, is to have some sort of a roller or a, a tire on your mower. Very simple little pattern here in a community, leaving an area unmowed. This is getting more popular now as we're starting to realize the carbon emission problem from our lawn mower. We've on a, been on a real push over the last several years now to try to get people to reduce the number of times that they're mowing their lawns, recognizing, number one, lawns are trapping carbon, right? Green plants are trapping carbon, and that's really good, taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But it seems a little odd that we're also burning a fair amount of carbon to keep the lawn. So we're constantly working on ways of being more sustainable. Keeping the turf healthy enough so that it can continue to trap carbon. Obviously, when it's brown and not growing, it's not trapping much carbon. But at the same time, not going crazy with the mowing strategies so that we're burning so much carbon. Here's one that I found. Uh, this is a lightning strike in a golf course fairway. And you can see sometimes you can get artwork in turf that you have absolutely no, <laughs> you have no reason you weren't involved in it at all other than you were there to take a picture of it. Here's that artist in Texas again. As the lawn started to green up, she liked the idea of maybe just purple polka dots. Here she is. Really just a fascinating, I mean, I, I personally think this would be really cool to live next to something like this. Is that just regular spray paint? What kind? What? It's just, uh, it's just, they make, um, they make athletic field marking paint. Oh, okay. Oh, that so you can put on the grass, doesn't kill the grass. Oh. Ah, well, you know, relatively. I, mean, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's good for the environment, but it's certainly, you know, titanium dioxide oftentimes. It wouldn't be something I'd want to necessarily disperse, but certainly it's degradable. Most of it degrades. Okay. And how, so, I mean, how long would that last? Well, on the brown grass, it would last a fairly long time because it's not growing. Right. On the green grass here, I would say at least three weeks to a month. Oh, and will it just disappear? If, like, it grows off. You mow it. Oh, it mows up. Would it run if it started? No, it sticks to the grass plants uh, fairly well. Uh -huh. It sticks to the grass plants fairly well. Uh -huh. Now, how about some flyovers? These are this is a little bit of a stretch for calling it turf, right? Wow. But but it's really some fascinating things. This is some uh, muck soil in Japan, where you can tell where they plowed a little and left some of the crop. But some of this stuff is actually amazing. This is actually from oh, Ellenville, New York. Oh. This is right down here in the Catskills, and you, I don't know if you can see them, but you can see some of the hang gliders. People hang glide over these things. Um, some really cool stuff. Here's one of the hang gliders. A, 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 a promotion for the American Museum of Natural History. Statue of Liberty. Again, you know, not, really, of course, this is really just a, 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 a hay field that was mowed, but you could do the same thing with a lawn. If you wanted to do it from your bedroom, you could, you know, get a stencil and mark it out with flags and go out there and cut some of it low, and you could do the same thing there. Here's my favorite, Sarah America. Somebody that went to the trouble of doing Sarah Palin in the middle of a, in the middle of a hay field. So, uh, and this is one that we did. This is uh, Marsh, one of Marsh's classes. Uh, this is our turf research facility. Um, Marsha did a one-credit course. Um, where they worked on designing this thing for Mother's Day. And then they were flying mothers for free uh, in planes over to see it. And so it, she actually produced a video that I think you can get on her website. You think? They made a video, a DVD of the production of this. And you know some of it's mulch, and you have hay bales. And some of this stuff here is nothing more than black plastic that they put over the top to etiolate the grass so it gets bleached. 
you know, if you oh, just exclude light from grass, it gets white or yellow, depending on how long. I mean, eventually, if you leave it on long enough, it'll get brown. But if you just leave it on for a little while, basically what you're looking at is light-starved grass. So you can do all kinds of things with different shades of green and maybe mulches, and there's some hay bales here. And this was an area that she, we, we killed out, and they did a maypole or something. I think they, it's a maypole in the middle. This is along the coast of Oregon. They did a little continental map here with grass around it. I thought that was kind of interesting. How about grass you can wear? <laughs> right? Neiman Marcus did a big thing a few years ago on garden attire, made some grass shoes. Again, you know, nothing more than you know, matted onto burlap, stapled onto a shoe. This is again a large sheet of burlap, and you can see here again the use of black plastic to give that leopard effect by doing a light exclu you know, excluding light from the grass, so you get that kind of leopard effect on the grass coat itself. Here's the garden party uh, ad that Neiman Marcus was running. Again, a hat, pocketbook, shoes. How about jewelry? This is one of my favorites that Craig sent me. You can, here's this little guy making jewelry. He's spritzing his little bit of grass, making a fashion statement here with a little tuft of grass on the end, or grass knuckles instead of brass knuckles. <laughs> now, here's what you need to do these things. Burlap, cheap grass seed, and peat moss. And you can make a bag. <laughs> this is one of Marcia's students made a grass pocketbook. How Here's long, a grass dress. How long would that stay green, though? Like, or alive? Uh, as long as you want it. Really? <laughs> how long if you put miracle Grow on it, I bet you, <laughs> you could, if you spritzed it with miracle Grow once a week and mowed it, I'm sure it would live several months if you gave it enough. <laughs> Hanging out on the this would be something you put on the clothesline when it's raining. <laughs> right? Instead of pulling the clothes in from the clothesline, put it out there when it's raining. So would the soil run? I mean, do you There's no soil. Oh, okay. Yeah, soil's overrated. And so it's just growing in the burlap? Right on the burlap. A little bit of peat moss. We grow sod. Uh, we have an ex I mean, this is not, I mean, yeah, this is really cool, but we've been doing this for the last 20 years on black plastic. Accelerated sod production is very popular in Europe, they'll use, uh, you know, compost at about an eighth of an inch, throw a ton of grass on it, make a grass mat, and use it for gold mouths or other areas that wear out really quickly so on the cross fields and soccer fields. So grass doesn't need soil? Yeah. Wow. Not, not if you're prepared to give it water and nutrients over the top. Huh. Wow. You ever seen it grow into cracks in the sidewalk? Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. See how easy my job is? <laughs> so how about some devices? These are somewhat whimsical. Um, this, is the, uh, this is whimsical, but it's actually a reality. What $112 million will buy you. This is the University of Phoenix Stadium out in, uh, outside of Phoenix, Arizona, where they often play the Super Bowl and the National Championship. And they wanted to be able to have a grass field inside. Now, I was involved in 1994. At, at the Pontiac Silverdome project when I was working at Michigan State University where we developed an indoor grass system to play the World Cup when the World Cup soccer was here in 1994. And um, uh, basically what we found is you really grass can't live in these dome stadiums for more than 30 days. So we've had, that's why you see a lot of retractable dome stadiums. They got them in Arizona and Seattle, uh, Milwaukee's got one, where the dome, Houston, where, the, where the, you, know, you open the dome for the grass, and then you close it so that the creatures can be comfortable when they're in there. Well, they decided an, a, an alternative to doing that in Phoenix is to slide the field in and out. And there you go. The field takes about an hour and 40 minutes. It's on this massive structure here on railroad tracks. It takes about an hour and 40 minutes to move in and out. <laughs> so when they're not using it, it sits outside and basking in the sun with a little bit of water. And when they want it, they roll it in. Okay, so next time you watch a game in Arizona, that's what you get. Of course, these are good uses for lawnmowers. The 
the redneck riding mower. <laughs> How about that? Grass bike, really nice with the grass jacket there, the integration of apparel and functional travel. The, sh <laughs> the grass bug, the grass accord. Somebody that's probably smoking some of the grass they're using. <laughs> a little bit of grass dashboard. How about a grass bo grass board? Instead of a dashboard, grass on the seats. Dude. How about this? Take your shoes off, walk on grass all day. <laughs> and then there's uh, one of the more interesting things we tried this past year is the use of grass as a film. This is some work that was done a number of years ago where they took a uh, grass canvas, literally grew it on burlap, which is what we did, and then um, made it dark and then exposed the, uh, this picture here and then shot the picture on the grass so that it would ultimately develop the picture, right? Because you'd have different shades of light over the top of the grass and that the picture itself would develop over time. This is, uh, again, a grass canvas with an overhead projector and a, a plexiglass pan of water dripping down. And so you have stripes uh, on the pan and water dripping in, and you could see it on the grass canvas. Here's some pictures. Uh, again, big grass canvas with a picture shown on it. Same here. This is how it looked, one that looked that was developed. And here's the one Marcia did in the library uh, last year. This is uh, two sheets of burlap with ryegrass planted on it, hacked to some two by fours, put together, and you can see the wood that's suspending it. And then we took a projector, computer image, and shown Gandhi on it. We had this big black box. I don't have a lot of the pictures of it. I should have it, but I can tell you it was the talk of the campus for about a two-week period because it had these little black holes. It had these little holes drilled in this big black draped uh, display that was, I don't know, I don't know how wide was it? 12, about 12 by 10. 12 by 10. And kids could go up to it and look, and you had all these Gandhi peaceful uh, sayings all the way around it. And eventually, it, we think we need a brighter light. I think that's one of the things. It didn't develop as good as we'd like. It did develop a little bit. But what we wound up doing, and I don't have the picture of it, is one day I went in there with, who was the, who was the woman? Christine. Christine. And we kind of brushed it. And we used a little bit of lawn, lawn, you know, lawn patterns with the, same, with the, um, with the uh, developing of the image on the thing as well. And after we took it all away, you could actually see Gandhi's face. So, with that, as opposed to uh, keep off the grass, my hope is that, you know, today and beyond this, that you go and use grass as a way of, I don't know, expressing yourself, as, it, as it's been for me, uh, stretching myself. Here's Fred. I can't, I, want, I can't do this without saying thanks to Craig. If you don't know Craig, you'll, some of you may have him today. This is Craig's dog, Fred, and there is nothing looks as good as a black and white dog on a nice green grass with a little bit of dandelion. <laughs> so, I hope that you have a wonderful day today, and I know you will have a lot of people out there like Danielle and Alex and Craig and Marsha who will be able to answer some of your questions. But one of the things that I like the most about what this invol involvement with this has not always been that, you know, it's a way of kind of expressing yourself artistically, which I never knew I had the ability to do any of that, um, but also that it's living and sustainable art. This is not the kind of work that has to damage the environment in any way. It's working with the environment. It's an easy way to make sustainable art that a lot of people can enjoy that you don't necessarily have to go to a museum to see. So my hope is that you have all those thoughts when you're doing this work, and really I think you're going to have a wonderful day. It could be kind of sticky hot out there today, too. Well, it's figures after it have been raining all this time. Do you, do you have any questions before I turn it back over to Marcia? Felter? You have grass on the, uh, the jewelry. What kind of grass on the jewelry? 
You know, I don't really know. I think some of it was moss, but most likely it's ryegrass because it grows so quick. It's pretty almost disposable. I mean, it grows on burlap. We grow it on your hat. That's not a bad idea, is it? <laughs> I can't say no to grass. <laughs> so it's no dirt, it's just peat moss and grass on yeah, grass on burlap, right? Just seed it really heavy and water the hell out. That's it. So it's burlap and then peat moss and then peat. <laughs> you we didn't use peat moss for the condi thing. No, that was just uh, that was just grass, grass on burlap. I mean burlap mud. has a water hole. I mean it has a structure to hold water. Now, there are different types of burlap, too. Though, right? We had a couple yeah. layers of burlap. So we had a good Did you have a couple of layers? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. And how long does that take to grow? Uh, a week. Yeah. Yeah. It's really so, amazing. So I was just pointing out, we reseeded it just because you, know, you think you lay it down evenly and you end up with a few spots, so we had to go back, seed a little bit more water. Did you grow it on the two by fours or did you tack it on after? We, we tacked it on before. You tacked it on before. So it'll hang, so the ryegrass will hang on a vertical surface. It'll stick. It roots right to the burlap. But how do you make it stick initially? Well, we, to a vertical surface. No, no, no. Well, we grow it flat. Oh, okay, I got it. And then we lift it. And once it gets some structure to it, you mold it. Once it gets some structure, and that's one of the things that's critical is when you're doing some of these things, it's really important to mow the grass a little bit because that encourages it to get dense. It's somewhat counterintuitive, but by clipping it, it gets thicker. It causes it to grow more laterally as opposed to growing straight up. How long did you expose it to the overhead projector to get the... Was it two, a week? We needed to get brighter and we needed, we needed a brighter light. Yes. <laughs> yes, I mean it won't live unless you give it water. Why? Now you could, you know, use the you can use warm season grasses in some places where they won't need much water. Right. Um, but there's no reason to think you couldn't. It just get established on the burlap and yeah. then pack it to the side of your house. Good. Or they could make a, a matrix structure of some sort that you could use. I mean they build straw houses. Right. Straw mm -hmm. bale houses. Certainly, sod roofs are not unique. They've been doing them forever. Right. And the thing that's nice about it is you can actually go up there and sit, as opposed to having to seat them that you can't touch or it'll die. Right. It's, it can be a little bit functional as well, which is what the idea was at Lincoln Center. Yeah? Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, like the picture of the trolley going down. Is that that sort of, you know, sort of matrix? No, I actually think that's um, that's uh, structural. It's like gravel with soil mixed in oh. that they grew grass over the top of, so it, it infiltrates in there. I've seen some things on parking. Yes, you do, and they don't work very good. It doesn't. I don't think so. We've tried that a few times, and we haven't found that it works so good. Yeah, but it's. I mean, grass. I mean, we really have the data now. There's no reason why we can't have grass parking. The trick with grass parking lots is um, we think that the trap, 70% of a parking lot are the spaces, about 30% of the traveling lanes. So the traveling lanes will be something other than grass. So we'll make the parking spaces grass. And then what's critical is that you, um, that you have the spaces on a diagonal because what we've learned is when you turn on the grass, especially when it's wet, you can tear it. So you want to be able to smoothly go in and park the car like that. But other than that, it's just it's this gravel. Gra grass grown on gravel. Yep. And we watered it for a week when we first put it in, and we we have done less than nothing to it. We've done less. I'm not just We've done virtually nothing to it, and it's been there. We've had it out there for four years. We've been driving on it and parking on it for four years. Yeah. So you could do that for your driveway. Absolutely. 
without question. You have question. to mow it, though, don't you? You could mow it. But you don't have to? No. Is there grass that grows a determinate height? No. Well, yes, grass will grow to a certain height. It'll flower if you don't mow it, right? You'll get these wispy seed heads. But you can mow it a little bit so that it doesn't flower. And some grasses grow very slowly and then flop over. No, we use tall fescue, the same stuff you're going to sod your things with today. Really? Yeah. I'm telling you, do I sound intelligent? I'm telling you, you don't have to be smart to do this. This is as easy as it gets. I mean, just a little sea, a little water, and you got it. Thanks very much. I hope you have a great day.